You are listening to Power Marketing with Kevin Lee. Kevin and his agency Did It have helped thousands of businesses win through superior marketing, as have his books, articles, speaking engagements, and the eMarketing Association Power Marketing Podcasts. Here's Kevin. I'm here today with David Deutsch, who's been doing copywriting for quite a while and uh, wanted to spend some time uh, talking with him about how copywriting and creative has changed over the years. But uh, before we do that, David, why don't you give yourself a, a Reader's Digest introduction? Well, um, it's great to be here. Um, I started out in advertising on Madison Avenue in Manhattan, where you are, not far from where you are, over on 42nd, over on 47th Street with Ogilvy and Mather. And uh went from, worked in ad agencies for a few years, and then got the uh, direct response bug. I found out that you could actually sell stuff directly in by direct mail and uh, later on the internet. When I first started doing it, it was only direct mail. And uh, worked in direct response ever since, doing uh, work for everyone from Fortune 100 companies like Procter & Gamble to you know, entrepreneurs, book publishers, uh, a lot of newsletter publishers and book publishers like uh, Boardroom and Rodale. And uh, now I do a lot of uh, coaching. I work with uh, I work with people who have copy teams, either internally on staff or freelance copy teams. I help them write better copy. I act as sort of a fractional creative director. Uh, for a lot of companies and work with a lot of uh, people that own companies that want to write their own copy and tend to find they make the best copywriters a lot of times because they know the product, they know the market. Um, and uh, with a little training in copywriting, they can go great guns. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. When I think back to the, the the days of direct response in the, in the nineties, um, the, I sort of feel like uh, direct mail copywriting was ha- was happening in parallel with what might have been called uh, either DRTV or infomercial marketing, which could have mm-hmm. been either short form or long form DRTV. Do you feel like those really sort of fed off of each other or sort of uh, happened in parallel and, and didn't really feed off of each other? Yeah, they they kind of mostly happened in parallel. They fed off each other a little bit. I've worked on some infomercials. There's some infomercial techniques that I've picked up. You know, this idea of, you know, if you call and lines are busy, please keep calling. That's such a great thing to say, whether or not lines are ever busy. It makes you think that there's (laughs) going to be a lot of demand for this this product. Is that bandwagon effect? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the uh, what what I find fascinating about what what I see uh, on YouTube these days is that uh, they actually call the style of of sort of mid to longer form um, YouTube ads VSLs or video sales letters, right? Right. Which brings to mind the sort of days of yore when when you were writing sales letters, like you you were actually right. writing sales letters that would end up being printed typically on an on eight and a half by 11 sheet and, and or one or more sheets and would go into a traditional <laughs> number 10 envelope and, and be mailed to folks. So it's interesting that a lot of the best practices that you hear about now with regards to sort of video uh, advertising are sort of spawned from this idea of the video sales letter. Um, and right. and I, I see a lot more similarities to the VSLs to direct mail copy than I do to the infomercial copy. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think also this may be a little bit sac- sacrilegious to say because uh, it's the e marketing association, <laughs> but you know, direct mail to this day can really be a secret weapon for a lot of companies to use because a lot of companies aren't doing it. It's not filling up your mailbox anymore. And it's it's such a, a you know it's a r- relative rarity to get a magalog in the mail or a number ten envelope stuffed with stuff. So I think yeah, they uh, work hand uh, in I'm, hand. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm definitely with you. As a matter of fact, uh, did it started my my agency my day job uh, started an entire direct mail division 
because we saw that direct mail uh, was starting to outperform as a result of um, initially just the, the the snail mailbox getting empty, both at a B2B level and at a B2C level. And then that was further accelerated during the pandemic because when people were doing work from home and, and they had no other social interaction, the arrival of the postal carrier might have been the single human interaction <laughs> that would occur that day. And so all of a sudden, getting direct mail was exciting again because you know sometimes Amazon was delivering at the same time. And so you were excited about seeing your postal carrier. So we actually saw direct response uh, conversion rates on direct mail go up during the pandemic, um, it, it, particularly in B2C. And in B2B actually it got a little bit more complicated because you have to try to figure out what the executive's home address was because you weren't going to reach them at their business address anymore. Right. And right. so, uh, you know, I, I'm absolutely with you. I think direct mail w- remains a, a, a foundational element of many companies' um, direct response marketing plans. Mm-hmm. Yep. Do, well, do you it's, feel like- all uh, is new again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, over the years, have you done, done uh, both uh, B2B and B2C uh, direct mail copywriting? Uh, yeah, yeah, quite a bit. When I was advertising some of the- uh, not Ogilvy, obviously, but you know some of the agent, some of the other agencies I would work for did a lot of business to business, and I used to love that because it's like all of a sudden I was I was learning about O rings, right, and <laughs> how they fit into things and how important they were that they you know that they didn't break down. And even now I've got a client that does autonomous manufacturing, and I'm I'm just fascinated now by you know learning about cutting sheet metal and things like that. Yeah, one of the things that's always uh, fascinated me from the perspective of of requiring sort of more creative copywriting was the idea that usually when you're doing B2C uh, mailings, right, you're actually reaching either the decision maker, you know, it, it via the, the, let's say, direct mail or, or, or some other vehicle, uh, whereas in B2B, you could end up with decisions being influenced by internal influencers, right, as well as, you know, folks who could actually make the decision. And so you weren't necessarily always mailing directly to the C-suite. You might also be, you know, mailing to people in procurement or mailing to engineers who had a vote in the decision-making process. And that trying to craft messaging that would resonate with these different types of audiences, to me, seems more challenging than just, you know, knowing that you're trying to reach the housewife or the person who's in charge of gardening at home or the person who might do HVAC, you know, uh, upgrades at a house, right? Whereas when you're doing B two B, you 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 don't know exactly who you're talking to, or maybe you do, and you need to come up with different creative for the engineer and different creative for purchasing. And so, how do you deal with the ambiguity of of the B two B sale process? Well, I think it makes for a very interesting. I mean, partly it makes for a very interesting psychological thing because a lot of times it's not the sales message is not as obvious right like the the cliche thing is that a lot of people buy ibm because nobody ever got fired for not buying ibm was the old saying so a lot of times it's how does this enable someone to do their job better not so much i want to sell you on the fact that this widget is the greatest widget ever right this it's it's there's also the element of this widget will enable you to keep your job or get promoted. Whereas if I'm selling diapers to, you know, a housewife for Procter and Gamble, it's, it's, the, she's going to keep her job no matter what. If she just cares about <laughs> that diaper being a great diaper, but, you know, certainly you want to be, you want to know like, okay, who, who are the people who are influencing the decision? Who are the people that control the decision? Who do you have to get approval for? Who are the um, who are the uh, audiences, right? Who are the influences on this? I've, I've done a lot of college marketing, um, and boy, when we were selling our services to colleges, um, there were you had alumni and faculty, and you had students, and you had the parents of students, and you had donors, and you had all these people that were involved in a in an academic institution that all had their own psychology way of looking at things and could 
potentially derail things or facilitate, you know, the sale. Sure, sure. There's, there's, it's interesting. You, when you mentioned uh, college marketing, it made me think about the nonprofit community and how they continue to be extremely dependent on direct mail and therefore on great direct mail copywriting. And one thing that that's probably somewhat unique to the nonprofit sort of donor marketing or, or you know, um, doing fundraising type type uh, direct mail is that you're really trying to push an emotional button, perhaps even harder than you might push an emotional button in a traditional, uh, uh, you know, sales letter or, or direct mail piece. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any sort of unique elements you think to when you're doing nonprofit based fundraising mail or could be other forms of direct response copywriting in, in comparison to sort of commercial uh, com commercial sales or commercial marketing? Yeah, well, I think certainly the thing that I've always found fascinating about nonprofit is that all you have is emotion. All you all you have to sell is the good feeling of giving giving us money, right? There's no thing we're going to give you in exchange for that money other than you will feel really good about this. So in maybe a, way, a small it, tax deduction. <laughs> maybe a small tax deduction <laughs> yeah. and maybe one of those little uh like stickers with your name on it, you know, your dress <laughs> yeah. labels or something like that or right. a card. I remember I one of the things that shocked me about um uh, fundraising was how effective those damn little cards are in fundraising letters, those little plastic membership cards, how effective gimmicks are. But, um, but yeah, you, you really like, that's all you have is that. And so it's great exercise. I think for anyone that wants to write for anyone that wants to be a better marketer is like, you should spend a year or two in fundraising and and get a feel for okay how do you how do you sell to someone based purely on you will get a good feeling by giving us money because ultimately that's true of even in a commercial exchange people buy because they will get a good feeling for giving you money and sometimes people forget that that and overemphasize the features and benefits of the item rather than the feeling you will get from purchasing the item or who you will be seen as by yourself and others from purchasing the item. That's a, that's a great point. Um, for younger copywriters who are perhaps, uh, you know, whether or not they majored in English or they majored in uh, public relations, or, you know, hopefully they've got the facility of language at, at their disposal, you know, upon graduating from, from college, if they went that far. But a lot of great copywriters, I think, never even you know, made it through that gauntlet and became great copywriters, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, despite, <laughs> not even despite, but because they didn't go to college and maybe they're a little I... bit more connected to to sort of the everyday person. Um, you know, but but for those people early in their their journey of copywriting and uh, the creative process, uh, are there any shortcuts that you would recommend uh, to, to allow them to become a, a great copywriter more quickly? Yeah, I would say there's a couple of things, right? There's one is sell something door to door, work in a telemarketing situation, right? Understand why people buy, why they don't buy, what, how words move people, how people react to things, the questions that people have, dealing with objections. I mean, it's just there's no better training than that, right? So many copywriters I know, one of the best copies I, I copywriters I know sold Amway for many years. And he said that was foundational for me because I, when I sold Amway, I could see people would get bored at a certain point and I would have to say something to right. kind of get them back again. Right. So, you know, I would say doing that and I would say knowing the product better than anyone else, right. Anytime you get to work for something, you, so much copy that I see in my coaching and training of people, so much of it is just, you could see as a superficial understanding of the product, right? They're writing about blood pressure, but they don't really know how blood pressure works and how the different drugs work and what the alternatives are there, but they're writing as if they read some cursory thing about it. And so it doesn't have the authoritative, you know, weight, gravitas feeling that, that something else would. And 
The other thing is just to study great copy, right? Study David Ogilvy, study Capel, study, you know, Gary Halbert. Um, know what makes them tick, how they did what they did, right? It's all right there on the page. Only 26 letters rearranged in different ways, right? You could, it's not like it's like a painting where there are brush strokes. You go, how did he do that? How did he mix that paint and get that color and then make the brush? Like, it's there, right? You can see the syntax. You can mathematically see how many words in sentences, how many paragraphs. Does he use big words, small words? Does he use more verbs than adjectives? It's all there for the study. Yeah, that that's a great point, and it, it I'm, I'm sort of again contrasting the 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 early early days when I was exposed to good direct response copywriting, which was via direct mail or late night infomercials, mm-hmm. and and now how I get exposed, which would be you know typically YouTube ads, uh, still direct mail to some extent, obviously, but you, YouTube ads or Facebook ads, and the one common theme there is. You know, it, it dawned on me sort of early in my my marketing and and business career that the fact that you were seeing the same ad over and over again told you that that ad worked, right? right. And that that was an ad you should deconstruct, right? If you saw the ad once and you never saw it again, chances are it wasn't working. Right? Whereas the ones that sort of continued to run in the case of of late night TV or or the the direct mail piece that you got three, four, five times. You know, yeah, you need the, the additional impressions to sort of get you over the hump. But the fact that you know you would continue to see a specific um, format or a specific set of language, to some extent, I think is a real validator that that's probably working. And so, if you're trying to sort of find copy to emulate, you should find the ones that are working. And there's so many great tools out there now that allow you to do that within YouTube or within Facebook with competitive intelligence monitoring. So you can Mm -hmm. literally go in there and find out, you know, which advertisers are crushing it in a particular category. If you're sort of having a creative drought. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, there's nothing like seeing what's working, uh, seeing the patterns, like what are the commonalities? Like you don't want to just copy things, of course, right? right? But to see the underlying patterns that all these things have in common and be able to, to duplicate that. And I think, you know, another piece of advice that I would have for someone kind of relates to that, which is put yourself into a situation where you're getting feedback. And I'm talking about feedback from someone that's a better writer than you, who can kind of guide you. And also from, from, from the market, like a situation where what you send out gets tracked right? Not like it's maybe you're doing blog posts and you never get any feedback about which blog post people like better, but where everything is measured, right? Because then you'll learn, right? Every time I write about crocodiles, I, so many people, you know, will, will read it. And when I write about, you know, monkeys, nobody reads it, right? That Like you learn these things. Um, you learn about people, like one of the things that, um, a guy I know always talks about, right, is how amazed he is that whenever he writes, he writes all this stuff about um, investing. He says, I write all this, you know, great investing advice and geopolitical, what's going on in the world. You know, it's great stuff. Could make people a lot of money. He says, and what, what, what do the analytics tell me works the best that people like? He says, when I write about my wife and kids and the problems we're having building this house out in the country, like that's what, that's what, and, and you learn something about writing and people and, and how to be effective from that, right? You learn that people, not in a theoretical way, in a, in a really gut way, you learn people want to learn about other people. They, that that's what gets people excited. And that's different from you should tell stories in your copy and your copy should be human. It's a different kind of learning to really experience that. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things that, that's uh, been super exciting for me is, you know, when I first got started in, in advertising back in uh, the J. Walter Thompson and McCann Erickson days, even though I wasn't necessarily on the direct response side, was you, you had to wait a long time to see whether your advertising worked. Right, right. now with Facebook and Google and programmatic display, if you think you have some copy that might be resonating with folks, you can get it out there and you can get some feedback pretty quickly, um, which I think helps because one of the challenges that, you know, I don't do a lot of copywriting, but when I do, 
I sort of can't decide when I'm done, right? Because I, you know, I have to sort of satisfy it at a certain level and say, yeah, I've sort of mushed it around a bunch of different ways. And I'm not sure if I've got the right formula down or not, but I feel like I'm comfortable testing it, like throwing it out there and seeing if it resonates <laughs> against the audience. And if it doesn't, then I know I wasn't done or I need to, you know, even start with a, you know, a, a fresh, a fresh drawing board back to the drawing board kind of situation. Um, but at least having that almost real time feedback loop. I think is empowering to anybody in a creative role, whether it's visual creative or, or, or copywriting. Yeah, I almost I almost want to be one of those people that says to young kids today, why in my day we had to wait months to get the results <laughs> of our advertising. You know, it's like really pops. <laughs> we just put it up there the same day and we get the results the same day. You know, the right. day I write it, I put it up and get the result. <laughs> oh, you don't you don't know how lucky you guys are. Right? <laughs> to your point of you know not knowing when to give up on writing something. I like to say copy is never really finished. It is merely abandoned. Right? Yeah. <laughs> one, one other interesting thing that, I, you know, it seems to be uh, like sometimes it's different camps, but it's but I think it's also more usage specific, which is this idea that, you know, in a society that increasingly is sort of everybody has super short attention spans right. is can you still do long form copy, right? Or, or are you stuck sort of, doing super concise copy, or do you potentially take long form copy, but put so much emphasis on the initial hook, right? To get the people in to pay attention to the longer parts of your story. You know, like, so is sort of, is there a one size fits all formula for that? Or is it extremely dependent on the product or service that you're, that you're pitching? Any thoughts on that? You know, um, there's that old David Ogilvy story about someone arguing him about people didn't read long copy. And he said, I bet I could make you read an entire, you know, I bet I could make you read an entire book. And the guy says, yeah, I bet you can't. And he said, he, you know, the guy's name was, you know, you know, Max Schmidlapper or whatever. And David Ogilvy bought a book the next day and the title, you know, he had the title dummied up and it was, this book is all about Max Schmidlapper, you know? And it's like, of course, I'm going to read a book all about David <laughs> George, right? So, yeah. you know, it, it depends on what, I mean, we read Harry Potter, we watch Netflix, for hours and hours and hours. We read what interests us. And, uh, you know, so you have to be interesting. You have to be interesting. You have to make it relevant to people. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's always been true. Uh, so a lot of it depends. A lot of it's very uh, contextual in terms of, you know, can you hold someone's attention for that long? Are you a good enough writer? Um, do you have enough to say about the product? Um, can you give people good information, right? Nobody wants to be sold for 60 minutes, but if you're helping them, if you're, you know, bonding with them and, and giving them good information, they'll stick with you for a long time. So, and, and like you said, you've got to hook them, you got to get them in there in the first place. And that's, I think that's a big failing of a lot of copywriters is they sort of, they write copy as if they're writing an article for a magazine that people subscribe to and will read, right? And instead of they're writing copy for someone that's surfing rapidly through the web or scrolling on Facebook, doesn't really want to spend time on your ad, wants to get to whatever the next thing is. And, you know, somehow you've got to A, suck them in and B, keep them there, right? And you've, it's, like uh, Arthur Johnson describes it as a three ring circus almost sometimes. It's like, look, there's the jungling bears. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and over there is, you know, um, you, you got to do so much, but you've got to, you've got to have that intensity of um, it. It's of like so much is at stake here, right? I can't let go of this reader. Once I've got them, I've got to do everything in my power. And that means you can't write a boring sentence, right? You've got to take out the stuff that people aren't going to read. You've got to be ruthless about it. You've got to have, you know, the best opening you can. Do you feel like um, either uh, perhaps great screenwriters or great stand-up comics have that sense of timing and storytelling that 
would you know suit be well suited to also writing direct response copy? That's an interesting question. Um, I find that uh, screen, a lot of times screenwriters, particularly uh, documentary screenwriters, make really good copywriters because they they have to do all the things that we do, but they have to. But what we do is also that plus selling. Like a VSL is really a documentary that sells, right? So, but they know how to tease, right? We'll be right after the next message. We're going to show you how the Mexican Pueblo Indians built, you know, houses that still stand the test of time or whatever it is, right? They'll, mm -hmm. they know how to tease. They know how to tell a story. Um, they know how to think visually. Um, they, they, and even more important, like two things that are incredibly important that screenwriters know how to do. They know how to work to a deadline because you don't mess around in television, right? Like when it's got to go on the air, it's got to go on the air. You can't, you know, you can't be late. And the other thing is they know how to, they know how to, uh, they know how to be given notes and respond to notes, right? Because they get notes from the producer and the director and the, the studio and whoever else. And they're adaptable to that. Right, right, and and as far as stand up comics, obviously some some of them do long form jokes, and some of them right, do right. you know one liners. <laughs> you know, it's certainly a discipline. I studied improv for a while just to exercise that part of me to study humor a little bit because you're right. Like if you can tell a good joke, you know a lot about timing, right, and how to hone words to have the effect that you want those. It's so many times I see with writers, right? They don't take the trouble to craft the words to have the effect that the words could potentially have, right? Um, and with a joke, you have to do that or the joke's not funny, it falls flat and it's kind of obvious. So I think doing stand-up comedy, which I've done a little bit of is, is a, great, a great exercise for that. I don't know that you could take a stand-up comic and make him into a copywriter the same way you could have, a, a good screenwriter, um, but I know I know at least one really good copywriter who was a really good stand-up comic, successful stand-up comedy comic, and a couple of others who are kind of could have been pretty successful <laughs> at it, right? That that are kind of students of humor and really you know look at humor in that in that way, and a great most of the comics I know, are, most of the copywriters I know are really good uh, joke tellers. Yeah, one thing that uh, is sort of fascinating about uh, a sort of a sexy topic at the moment is the idea of using influencer marketing as as part of a marketing channel. And of course, in the case of influencer marketing, you know, the the brand or the agency may give general themes or talking points to the influencer, but in order to keep it authentic, they often allow the influencer to, you know, as, as long as it's generally on topic, they allow the influencer to sort of craft their own story around right. the product or around the service. Uh, which of course requires a certain sense of almost spontaneous content creation, which is a little bit different than sitting down and crafting copy. Maybe it's a little bit more similar to to a stand-up comedian, but it it doesn't have quite the same structure. And so maybe it requires a certain talent, right, to to, to do that almost spontaneously. But do you feel like the same general storytelling best practices exist within that influencer marketing area as well? Uh, and is that sort of an anathema to copywriting in a sense that it's not thought through and it's not necessarily as as orchestrated or choreographed as it might be if it was if it was you know copywritten? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly don't think anything that works is an anathema to copywriting, but that's that's a direct response kind of you know. But I I find that fascinating and 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 so interesting um, the ability to let an influencer write do their own creative thing. And when that works, it's so powerful. Stuff that I've seen on TikTok and other places where you have someone whose videos I've seen and then they do a little promotion for something and they do it like perfectly in their own style. It's just so right and so, so nice. And I think that there's a, like you talked about with infomercials, there's a feeding off of each other. I think now mainstream advertising I don't know about direct response so much, but mainstream advertising is being influenced by that sort of thing, right? They're having ordinary people make videos. They're they're using TikTok style cuts in in what they do. 
there's a there's a kind of a freedom and an individuality to things that that is a nice uh, giving a nice variety and having a nice influence, I think, on on mainstream advertising. And you could go with it or fight it, right? But, <laughs> right. It's, it's yeah, I guess in the end, if it works right, then then go with it. <laughs> yeah, kind of like AI. You know, you can go with it or you could fight it, but you know, it's going to get better and better. So you might as well learn about it. I feel like you might as well learn about it and, you know, see how it can be kind of a partner for you because, uh, you know, some amazing things in artificial intelligence, as you probably know. And Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, the the I haven't really had a chance to dabble with the AI based, you know, writing programs, but I do recall reading uh, the, the legal opinions that uh, AI based uh, creative and content in general uh, are not copyright protected, right? Because they're not created by a human. <laughs> so to some extent, you 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 lose the legal protections <laughs> to your copy if it's 100% copywritten by AI. But of course, this idea of a, a collaboration between a human and and an AI is is I think where most of the people are leaning uh, who are starting to dabble with AI created content. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's to me, it's like a very underpaid writing assistant that, you know, I don't care if 80% of what they write is junk because I can throw out the junk and the 20% is kind of like, well, that's an interesting idea I would have never thought of. I wouldn't do it like that, but it does make me think of doing it like this, right? Right. Because that's what creativity is, is kind of like, you know, you, you bounce off someone else's way of thinking. They say something and that leads you, you know, like a billiard ball kind of bouncing off in a direction you didn't anticipate. Great, great. Well, um, other than the, the intersection between sort of AI and, and human generated creative, is there anything that has you excited for the next year uh, within the sort of marketing or advertising or direct response ecosystem? You know, I think what has me excited is that there's so much opportunity for doing things, right? There's so many different ways for people to sell things. There's so many different ways for people to express themselves. So even I'm, I personally am looking into things like Substack, right? As a publishing, like all of a sudden, it's so easy to publish a newsletter and do it on Substack. It's so easy to publish videos and do them on YouTube and TikTok. Um, and that means that it's easy for companies as well. So I'm excited for my clients, right? To be exploring something like TikTok, uh, to be exploring making videos for YouTube. Um, both the clients that are, you know, relatively small companies and even the larger ones, right? Are discovering. I, I think what's interesting too is a lot of larger companies discovering uh, direct response which has been kind of interesting, um, you know, selling things by subscription, you know, larger companies selling consumer goods by subscription. Um, there's stuff I've sold subscriptions to that I, I would have never thought, you know, you could sell a subscription to it, but, you know, apparently you can. Right. Yeah, that, you, you're, that is certainly exciting. And uh, if in fact there's going to be some, uh, you know, economic hiccups, which there always are eventually, you just never know when they'll show up. But if there are going to be any economic economic hiccups, you know, direct response marketing and advertising tends to be the the more stable as a, as opposed to, you know, upper funnel branding and awareness advertising. It's the folks who operate within the lower third of the funnel seem to uh, have more job security and have more ability to sort of demonstrate their value uh, to the to the CMO and to the CFO. So it, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if that continues to catch on, if we do face some economic challenges over the next year. Yeah, that's a great point. I like to think of branding as something that you could either do over the long term, but I also think that we brand, even in direct response, you, you brand the, the, the company, you brand the person, writing who the letter is ostensibly from, you brand the product, you know, within the letter itself, right from the beginning. And I sometimes I see that done effectively, right? Where it's like, wow, this is, I would buy anything from this guy because it's right. 
starts out like he's credentialized. Um, he seems to like me. Um, he seems to care about my well-being. And then sometimes you see copy where there's no branding at all. It's like mm -hmm. it's 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 soulless. It doesn't seem to even be coming from a real person. Um, and and it's a, I think it's a lost opportunity. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think, you know, uh, branding can come along for the ride, right? So if, if your KPIs work from a direct response basis and you've done a good job at storytelling along the way, you know, the branding is a byproduct of the great direct response uh, creative to some extent. So not, not every direct response creative has branding coming along for the ride. Sometimes it's not attempting to, to you know, push any emotional buttons, but it should be. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Jay Peterson, Jay Peterman was a great example of that, right? Those catalogs that were all story, right? He just branded himself with his brand was great stories, right? <laughs> Who knew if the if the clothing was any good? But right. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it clearly made such an impression on Jerry Seinfeld that he decided to create the take the character and put him into it, put him into the the, the sitcom. So. Uh, you know, because I think again, comedians and storytelling, I think, go hand in hand. So it, 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 it is. And it's always fun to see what we do kind of just go out into the mainstream a little bit. Like, yeah, that's right. kind of what I do that, you know, <laughs> going through catalogs and things like that. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thanks so much uh, for chatting about uh, copy and the power of copywriting and the fun that we can have uh, creating great copy. It was It was great to catch up, David. Well, thank you. It was fun for, for me as well. And uh, it's great talking to you. Thanks for having me on. Kevin Lee's Power Marketing is available on all your favorite podcast networks. Kevin loves helping businesses excel at marketing. Having marketing challenges? Just like Santa in the Miracle on 34th Street. If Kevin can't help you, he'll know someone who can. Find him on LinkedIn, subscribe or follow.